glad that you are here in this place with us today. Those of you watching online, glad you guys have joined us as well. Hope you're being blessed this morning like I am. I love worshiping with Brett and his team. And, and what I love is the fact that it doesn't matter who's up here. Man, we get to be in the presence of God, and they take us there. It's someplace they're familiar with being, and so it's easy to take us there, and I love that about our team. So I'm so grateful for the worship that they have. And um, as you saw the little video, our, our theme this season is the gift of grace. That's what we're focusing on. That's what we're talking about during this series. Uh, Mark kicked us off last week with a fantastic setup of Jesus and, and looking at Jesus from John chapter 1. Uh, if you want to turn there, that's where we're going to go here in just a minute. But um, John chapter 1 is there. And, and I thought about this idea of this gift of grace. And gifts are something that we focus a lot on during this season. That tends to be kind of our default that we, that we go to. We prioritize a lot of times. When I think about the amount of time I do things during this season, shopping, getting gifts, ordering gifts, wrapping gifts, unwrapping gifts, delivering gifts, gifts take up a lot of time. And, and it seems to be a focal point at times. So it made me think this, what is the best gift you've ever gotten? Like, have you thought about that at all? I, I, I think about it from time to time. I, I know Mark's told this story on several occasions that uh, when he was a kid, he got his electric football set and turn it on and how much that meant to him in that. And, and, or even this, what's the best gift you've ever given? Like, wow, what, do I stop and think about that? Like, do I just check the list of what they want? Like, how meaningful is that? Well, rewind the clock just a little bit to the week of Thanksgiving. And it was that Monday before Thanksgiving, and Amy, my wife, and my two kids, we went out to East Texas, almost to Louisiana, and uh, to spread my mom's ashes. And she had passed away this summer in June. She, she died um, between youth camp and mission trip uh, for my summer. And we had the service back in July, and, and it was good, and that was fine. Kind of closure piece, to be honest with me, with you about me. And, and then she was cremated, and so her desire was to have her ashes spread near her brother and sister-in-law out there in Way East Texas and all. And it took me a while to get to the point where I could, where I could do that, where I was, uh, had the strength and the willingness to go honor her in the way that she had asked. That was the week that we did it. So we headed out early Monday morning, and we go out there, and, um, and we, the cemetery is just right down the road from, from where she lived. And so we walked down there, and, and we, we had that moment that, uh, that we were there. And, and, and uh, while we were there, uh, my cousin, who she had lived near there, had a whole bunch of stuff that she had piled in my mom's old house and said, hey, I found some of these things. Um, take what you want. I just, I want to offer that to you, whatever. And, and there's things in there you're like, whoa, I don't, I don't want that, but man, you know, that, and you know, kind of that kind of stuff that's there. And then one thing jumped out at me above everything else. It was like this shining light and it was this right here. This is my first baseball glove. And uh, not my first little plastic one that you play t-ball with, but, um, but the real leather one. And, uh, and this was it. I haven't seen this thing in, in forever. And, uh, and, and so it took me back, you know, all the smells and all the things uh, were pretty incredible. And, and I put it on, still fits. And uh, I could still make the same number of errors that I made before. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but having this thing, it, it brought all, this was, this was the treasure. I mean, this was it. And it came with a plan. Like I, I totally remember talking with mom and dad, mostly dad, um, when I opened this up on Christmas morning and he said, Son, that's your first step playing college baseball. Like, that's, that's going to be it. This will carry you through. And, and I thought, that's an okay plan, Dad, but I'm playing in the pros. So let's not sell this plan short. Like, this is what we're going to do. But, but that was the, the plan that was there. And we'll get to what happened with that. But uh, I didn't make it to the major leagues. But uh, that's, I didn't make it to college. So, <laughs> but when you can't hit and you make up for it by not throwing very hard, it's a good combination to get a college scholarship. <laughs> but, uh, but I didn't even know where this thing was till, till last month. And, and there it brought back all of this stuff. And, and, and I thought about that, that plan that we had. And I thought, okay, let me ask you guys this. How many of you in here, raise your hand if you have plans this holiday season? Anybody have plans? Yeah, so everybody should raise their hand. If you didn't, you just lied. Um, like, that's not true. I don't have a plan. Well, then you're planning to do nothing. It's still a plan. Um, but we all, we all have plans, right? And there, there are different plans that we make as we go. We're going to go out of town uh, or not. We're going to go see the lights. We're going to go see a show or a movie. We make plans on what to give or what to make, who to see, who to avoid. 
uh, how late to sleep in. And then we think about plans for the new year. What are my plans for 2022? What are, what are we going to do in there? Plans to lose weight or plans to find a new job, plans to get married. So I'm, I got four weddings next year that I'm already getting to do. Uh, plans to read the Bible more. See, our calendars are full and getting fuller all the time with plans. Like there's, there's plans. We have our calendars on our phone. We have our calendars on our wall. We have our calendars wherever we have them. And, and we're constantly adding plans to them. Benjamin Franklin said this, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. That's what either, I think it, was, it may have been Shakespeare that said that, but somebody said that. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. But from the beginning of time, I'll tell you this, God had a plan, and he had a plan to save the world. That's been his plan. Everyone wanted to know the plan. Matter of fact, there were some people, we can call them wise men or shepherds, who made plans to go see the plan. Right? They came from far and near. There were other people, Herod leading the way most notably, that made a plan to get rid of the plans. And that, so there's always these plans being made. So this morning I have one verse that I want to unpack for you, and we're going to dig deeply into it, and, and you'll see where we're going to go, because I think weirdly. But John chapter 1, verse 14. This is where we're going to unpack this verse today. I want to read it to you, and then we're going to talk a lot about it. Verse 14 said this, The Word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I, I wrote this in the Allen Revised Standard Version, and so here's how I wrote this verse as I was studying it this week. Jesus became human and showed up where we are. We have seen his awesomeness because we have seen the goat, the greatest of all time, his Son the same as his dad, with a perfect balance of gifts, something we don't deserve and something we desperately need, grace and truth. That's, that's how that verse spoke to me as I was studying. And that's, that's what jumped out to me as I was unpacking this thing and trying to understand. But, but then it hit me in this, is that God is so much wiser and smarter than any of us, especially me. God is brilliant in his thinking. He's brilliant in his ways of doing. That's why scripture says his ways are not like ours. His thoughts are not like ours. He is absolutely brilliant in this. And because of that, God knew that the plan was secondary to something more important. And that's the presence. Not with bows and, and, and wrapping paper. Presence, his being with us, right? Follow me on this. The, the presence that's there. It seems to me that that's how God works before the plan, the presence. Let me explain as I go, because when we read John 1.14 and we read other stories in the gospel and we read these things about that, we think about Jesus showing up. We think Jesus made his appearance on earth as a baby on December 25th, all those years ago. This is what we believe that Jesus did, his, his arrival on our planet. I would argue that wasn't his first time to show up on earth. Let me explain as we go, as we go here. Um, in Genesis 18, I'm going to hit several of these. You don't have to turn there. There's one or two that might be on the screen as I go, but I want to hit some of these real quick. But in Genesis 18, we see these three visitors that show up to Abraham, and, and one of them is called the Lord. You can draw your own conclusions through that, is with two of these angels. And in that moment, they have this conversation with Abraham, and they say, listen, you're going to have a kid. And he's like, do you know I'm 100? Do you know how old my wife is? Like, He's doubting this is going to be a possibility. And this plan of a promise of a son that he is going to have, even though both of them are way past childbearing ages, what happened one year later? They had a son. They, they had a son. Before the plan, the presence. See, Jesus showed up with a plan, but he showed up first. His presence trumped the plan. Fast forward again to Exodus chapter 3. We meet this guy, Moses. And Moses is, is an older guy hanging out on a mountain with some sheep and just kind of minding his own business, doing his own thing. He's had some rough times in his life, as, especially as a baby. Uh, it was kind of a difficult ride for him there. And then he had a pretty good time. Then he committed murder. Like he did some things that were kind of questionable. Now this is where he is. And, and he's tending these sheep. And all of a sudden there's this fire on this mountain. And he's like, that's strange, there's a fire over here. Let me go check that out. And he begins to walk to the fire, and the fire starts talking to him. What this, It's not burning up, 
And, and the fire is literally talking to him in that moment. And it said, got a plan for you. You're going to lead the people out of Israel, out of slavery, and into the promised land. And he's like, no, I'm not. You got the wrong guy. Like, I'm not confident. I don't speak well. I have a past. Like, I'm not sure I'm the right guy for this situation right here. And this is what he said to him. He, uh, it, it said that an, an angel of the Lord. No, it didn't. It said the angel of the Lord. Not just an angel. The angel of the Lord. I believe Jesus. Why? Because he calls himself I am. And didn't Jesus do that again in the New Testament? I am. Like, he called himself, I am. I am with you. I am present. I am here. I am available. I am with you in this. I am. Before the plan, the presence on that mountain. We know how that turned out later on. Fast forward again, Joshua chapter 5. I'm going to read some scripture in this. Because I think this is one of the best examples of presence before plan. So Joshua 5, 13 through 15, if you're taking notes, you can jot that down, but it'll be on the screen. It says, when Joshua was by Jericho, now here's, here's the, the, the context of that. Joshua is now leading the people. They're going to go take the promised land that had been promised to him. Moses died. So now Joshua's taken over. There's a great series that we did a while back here. You can look up, but it's fantastic. Anyway, Joshua's there, and he's now going over to Jericho. He's like, okay, we are supposed to wipe out this land. We're going to take over, like, okay, let's look at Jericho. That's a big city. Those are big walls. That's a lot of people. Like, I need to get a plan together. I need to get a game plan. I need to get a scouting report. This is what I need to do. So when Joshua's by Jericho, that's what he's doing, getting a scouting report, making a plan. He lifted, his, lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. That'll get your attention. I'm on a stealth mission. I don't want to be seen. I want to look at Jericho. I want to strategize. Uh, and there's this guy with a sword. Now, I'm picturing Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, I'm picturing this muscle guy. I, I don't know. That's just in my mind what it is. And it gets his attention. And this is what he says to him. Joshua went to him and said, like, which is crazy. Like, I would have peed my pants and run away. If I see that, I'm out. I'm done. Like, I, something bad is about to happen, and I don't want to be a part of it. I'm done. But Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? You for us or them? Like, I need to know where I stand with you because you're a bit intimidating and I need to know if this is going to go well for me or bad for me. Like, are we on the same team or not? Are you for us or for our enemies? And he said, no. That's not an answer. I ask a question. Are you for us or them? No. That's like the answers I get from my kids all the time. It makes no sense. I'm asking you a question. You're going, I don't know. That's not okay. But that's what he said. But he continues, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Let me tell you who I am. You're asking the wrong question, man. Are you for us or are you for them? No. It's not about you or them. It's about me. Because I am here. I am present. I am with you. Man, that's a powerful statement. And look how he responds. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. You think that reminded Joshua of anything? Maybe a story that Moses had told him before as his mentor. Hey, bro, let me tell you about this time I met God. Jesus showed up in this fire, and it was ridiculous. And he said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And he gave me this whole plan of what we're going to do. He's having flashbacks. Take off your sandals. Now, he didn't show up in a fire. He showed up with a sword and just take off your sandals. It, it all came back to Jesus. It came back to Jesus being there. Joshua did so. It's not about you or them, but him being here and present and available before the plan the presence. Fast forward to Judges 6. Now, Judges is one of my favorite books of the whole Bible. Um, if you want to read about great stories, uh, it reminds me of Princess Bride a whole lot, uh, for those that love that movie. But uh, it's fantastic. The, the people of Israel are just not real smart. 
um, they do something dumb, they have a consequence, it's really bad, it lasts a long time, like crazy 18, 20 years of consequence, they go through all this, they cry out, God help us, God help us, and God sends a deliverer, and God, that deliverer gets them back to good again with God, and it's good for a while, and then they mess up again. And this is an ongoing cycle. See, you think our kids were the first ones to do the same thing over and over again, right? It's not. We've all been doing it forever. And so that's what they were doing, and Judges 6 introduces us to a guy named Gideon. Now, this guy was the least in his family. His family was the least in the tribe. His tribe was the least of all the tribe. Like, he was the bottom of the barrel guy. He was voted least likely to succeed in his high school class. Like, this is who Gideon was. He was not much to look at or think about. And the Israelites were in this bad place. So, of course, the plan is, let's cry out to God and get rescued from this. It's the same plan that we've always done, and God's going to send somebody uh, like Othniel or Ehud or Shamgar. All of those guys came through in the past, and it says, the angel of the Lord shows up. Again, not an angel. The angel of the Lord shows up, and he's hiding in a wine press because he's scared, because he's, he's the wimp. He has no answers. He has no hope. He has nothing. And the guy says, mighty warrior. He's like, is there someone else in this wine press with me? Because I'm not believing that. Mighty warrior. You're going to save a nation. <laughs> he doesn't even know he's talking to Jesus at this point. He keeps calling him sir. Like, uh, sir, well, if this is true, give me a sign. Let me, let me go prepare a sacrifice for you, a burnt offering for you. Let me go do that for you. All right, go ahead and do that. So he goes and prepares it. He puts it on the rock. And he says, all right, you might want to stand back. <laughs> fire. And, and Jesus disappears with the fire. He's like, okay. And then you can read chapter 6, 7, and 8, and it's a fantastic story of what he got to do, of how he led, of how God used him in an incredible way. But before the plan, the presence. His presence was there before the plan. Now, those are some great Old Testament things, but what about New Testament? Well, obviously, we know in John 1.14, we're talking about that, that, that he, he came, word was made flesh and dwelled among us. So we know that he arrived in that moment, and that's the story we talk about it at Christmas time, and, and that's great. But are there others? Yeah, let's fast forward even more to Acts chapter 9. Now, this is a fantastic one, too, this guy named Saul. And maybe you know his story, but let's think out about it from this direction of this. He is, he is on a mission, he has a plan, and his plan is working. He is having a successful plan of destroying the church. Like he was there holding the guy's clothes when Stephen got stoned. Like he is on the path of success. He is the Osama bin Laden of that time. This is who he was. And he was breathing out, it says, murderous threats against the church. He wants to destroy anybody that belongs to the way, which is the way of Christ. This is what he is out to do. He's already gotten papers so he can go to Damascus and wreak havoc there. And that's where he's at. He's on his way to Damascus. And as he's walking, this bright light shows up, so bright that it knocks him to the ground. It's not just, man, I need some sunglasses. No, this is worse than when you come out of the movie theater and it's still sunny outside. Like, that's bad. And so you, you get what I'm talking about. It blows him away. All of his friends, they're all knocked to the ground. And, and in that moment, there's this voice that says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting Jesus? Why are you persecuting God? Why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting me? And his response is, who are you? He asks the voice, who is this? He said, I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. Jesus shows up and says, now, you're in a tough spot. You can't see. So you and your tough guys, you're going to have to hold hands walking into Damascus. That's what you're going to have to do. Isn't that great? He made this big tough guy hold hands with people. Okay, I'm walking into Damascus. So he goes into Damascus, and then Ananias, one of my favorite people in all the Bible, has the guts to go and pray with him, lead him to Christ, baptize him. Fantastic story. And then what happens? His name changes, Saul to Paul. And he had the, the plan that God had was to, to share the gospel with the whole world. But he needed someone who was willing to go to the whole world. He needed someone who was willing to go through tough times, go through tragedy, go through this. Well, he got rescued from a pretty bad situation, from a pretty tough lifestyle. He went everywhere. Read his stories. He wrote most of the New Testament. All the pictures in the Bible are for him. They're his maps. Like, he's pretty significant. But before the plan... The presence. The presence changed everything. The plan was 
easy compared to the present. I think that's so important for us to understand because God does have plans for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Plans are important. I'm not saying they're not. But before the plan, the presence. Regardless of your circumstances, your time of life, your fears, your doubts, your insecurities, or your past, you're not disqualified from his presence. He is present and he is available. Look at what we just saw. We saw two old people in the twilight of their life have a son whose offspring would be a blessing for generations. We saw a guy with a speech impediment who committed murder and told he would save a nation. We saw a guy with his mentor die and he's trying to figure out his next move with Jericho. We saw this seemingly insignificant guy be given the keys to victory. We saw a guy intent on destroying the church be transformed into the greatest missionary of all time. Why? Because of his presence. His presence changes everything. See, we we think gifts change everything. No, no. His presence changes everything. We are all facing decisions and struggling with doubt and insecurity as we head into Christmas. We're looking for a plan for what's next. See, now here's what I do. When I don't get the answer that I want, then I say, God, where are you? I'm not satisfied with what I don't want. I I want what I want, and I'm a pastor. I should get perks, right? I should have extra access. I should have extra gift. That's not how God works. I, I I don't deserve any of that, but he continues to offer me his best. And and it's crazy that I get frustrated because when I'm in pain, I want a plan. This summer was hard to, to, to be between youth camp and mission trip and my mom die and doing her funeral. And during that time, I got diagnosed with the cancer at that time. I wanted a plan. I needed a plan. And so I struggled with that. Fear crept in. Doubt crept in. Like, what's going on? What did I, God, what did you do? Where are you? This isn't fair. Like those were the words that, that, that first came into me as I was walking through all this stuff. I got to put on a good face because I'm the pastor and I go into camp and mission trip and I'm doing all these things. But I was hurting. And the only answer was not a plan, but God's presence. So I went to Mark and said, Mark, Scripture says that if someone is sick, that they should get the elders and they should pray over them and anoint them with oil that they may be healed. And that's hard to do because you have to swallow your pride. You have to humble yourself there. But Mark and the elders rallied around me on a Wednesday night. They anointed me with oil and prayed over me. And I felt God's presence. And it was wonderful. And I didn't need a plan. Do I have one? Yeah, I mean, the doctors, I have medicine I take. I, you know, stuff. Matter of fact, I got a checkup on Thursday and my PSA level was cut in half. And I'm back in normal range. Praise God for that. but it's not because of something I did. It's not because I followed a plan or checked a box. It's because of his presence, and that's what he chose to do. Same thing when I was dealing with my mom, and I didn't want to go spread her ashes. I I wanted to move on. I had a plan to move on, and that's here, and I'm going to move here, and that I couldn't get away from it anymore. So we went, and we got into the cemetery, and me and Amy and Colby and Molly, we circled up. I told them, I said, Guys, be, be ready to pray. That's all I know to do. I don't, I don't have a plan on what to do. And God's like, finally. So we circled up, and they prayed, and I couldn't. All I could do was cry. But I felt God's presence. I didn't need a plan. I needed his presence. I needed to be near him. And he was never far. I just had to turn around. I had turned my back because I had a plan. I can compartmentalize. I can move forward. I don't have a plan for Christmas. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to be sad. I'm going to miss my mom on Christmas this year. Many of you guys are going through the same thing. Somebody that for the first time, you don't get to have Christmas with them. Quit making a plan and start looking for his presence. That's where you're going to find hope. It's where you're going to find healing. It's where you're going to find comfort. Where you're going to find peace. And as he promised in the scripture, grace and truth, because he's full of that stuff. God had a plan to save the world, but before that plan, he sent his presence. Jesus became 
flesh and dwelt among us. His plan was revealed through His presence. And I don't know who needs to hear this besides me today, but I'm going to say it, and it's not easy to, see, to hear. But we need to stop getting frustrated that God hasn't revealed His plan to you when you don't make time for His presence. I'm really good at being busy. Like it, It's a badge of honor at times, but I don't see it as a spiritual gift in Scripture. We have no right to be frustrated that God hasn't revealed His plan when we don't make time for His presence. And that's hard. And sometimes it takes months, like for we, me with my mom. But God is so good. Maybe we need to make a plan to be in His presence this month. Maybe we need to put that on the calendar. He's present and available to be still and know that He is God. To receive the gifts of grace and truth one that we don't deserve and one that we desperately need. Right now in our, in our youth ministry, I challenged our students to read the book of Luke this month. Um, there's 24 chapters and, and there's 24 days leading up to Christmas. And so I challenged them to read a chapter a day, 1 through 24. We're going to read the whole life of Jesus before we celebrate his birth on the 25th. So let's get the whole big picture and not just focus on that. So that's what we've been doing. We've been reading. Hopefully we've been doing. We've been challenged to do it. Um, and so yesterday, Luke 11 uh, really jumped out at me as I was praying through all this. Luke 11, verse 11 through 13 says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He's offering the gift of His presence. That's what He offered. He said that He would be with us. He said He would send His Spirit, the Comforter, all the things that the Holy Spirit does. That's His presence. All we got to do is ask, and He's willing to give it. Like, it's not even on loan. Like, it's for good. Like, here, this is what you have for that. He didn't come dwell among us because we got it right. We didn't win the lottery, so Jesus showed up because we were the best, or we were good or we won. That, that's, that's not why he came. He didn't come to dwell among us because we got it right. He came because we got it wrong. And he knows how to make it right. I mean, John 3.16 is the foundation of everything that we believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not die but have eternal life. Like That's, that's what he said to us in there. And if you've never accepted that invitation to give your life to Christ. And what I mean is the great exchange. I don't mean going to church and checking a box. I don't mean being better than your neighbor. I don't mean saying, yeah, I went to all these things and, and these classes. And I went to VBS and camp. Those are all great things. When did you get into his presence? When did you say, I can't do it. My plan failed. My plan's not enough. My plan led to hurt. My plan led to divorce. My plan led to this. My plan, I'm tired of my plan failing. I'm ready for your presence. When did that happen? Because if you've never taken that step of exchanging your life for the life of Jesus, I invite you today without any other thought in your head, make that choice. Don't let pride get in the way. Maybe, maybe you're saying, well, you know what, Alan, I, I did, I made that decision as a kid, but man, I don't know, I, I feel very far from him, it's tough. Well, part of that reason may be sin. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He promises that. Maybe you just need to come to this altar and confess and repent. Maybe you need to come to an elder and say, I'm sick spiritually. Will you pray over me for healing? Maybe you need to do that today. But we don't because if I come up here, someone thinks, well, they're going to think something's wrong with me or I'm bad. Stop worrying about what other people think and get into his presence. If you can't do it here, you're not going to do it when you get home. TV's too addicting. Phone's too addicting. Laziness is too addicting. Let's quit making excuses and start being in his presence because there's no better place to be. And it starts right here, right now. And I'm going to ask the band to come up here and play. And we're going to do a song. It's not to, to impress you or perform for you. If nothing else, it's to make some noise so you can have time with God. That's what it's for. 
Maybe there's words that are going to hit you in the heart that you need to hear. I don't know, but my, my request is this. You do what God asks you to do. It, it doesn't matter what kickoff is. It doesn't matter what, what your reservation for lunch is. It does. Right now, God's presence matters most. And I'm asking you to sit in it, to be still and know that he's God. To not check the notifications that vibrated on your leg while the sermon was going on. But to focus on what God is saying to you right now. He is here, he is present, and he is available. He is not here to judge, he's here to love. He's here to meet you where you are and walk with you what his plan is. And maybe he needs to reveal that to you. I never did play college baseball. But I did make it to professional baseball. I'm the chaplain for the Round Rock Express. So I'm in a professional locker room. God had a plan all the time. It wasn't mine. And when I found this glove, all the things that came back, none of them were the plays that I made. None of them were the games that I went to. Everything that came back was sitting with my dad, teaching me how to oil the glove. Teach me how to wrap it up, put it under your mattress so it breaks in correctly. Sitting with me, relacing it when I broke it, showing me how to do it because I was frustrated and wanted to throw it away. And he said, no, 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 this is yours. And he took the time to show me how to do it. See, everything about this took me back, not to events, but it took me back to my dad's presence. It took me back to those moments with my father. And this season, we need to get in the presence of our father. We just need to sit with him. We just need to listen to him. We just need to hear him saying, this is the way. Walk in this. And we can walk with confidence. That's where I want us to be this Christmas. I believe that's where God wants us to be this Christmas. And I believe that's what he's offering is his presence. To say, come. Come meet him for the first time today. Don't let anything get in the way of that. Come repent. Don't carry that stuff around this season. Come celebrate. Come get healed. Come grab someone and say, let's pray together. 